Okay. All right. Um, so let's begin the lecture. Um, last time we had finished, almost finished LTE, but now I have added one more uh, slide. Now this is what you're supposed to do. Just take the first 10 pages of the previous handout and then throw away the rest. <laughs> and this is starts on page 11. Okay, I have added this slide and, uh, and other slides are also changed. So to avoid the confusion, you can throw away the previous 11 through whatever and these are the new 11 through 23, I think. So, um, we, we talked about LTE last time, there was a long term evolution and um, we talked about the features that it had, most of them were similar to WiMAX except um, they had this single carrier uh, FDMA and um, so there, are, there is one more feature here which I thought was relevant here because the way the world is going is that an LTE followed what was in WiMAX and then and WiMAX 2 is going to follow what is in LTE, you know, so I mean this you know, kind of development goes on. So this feature is one of the features that we will talk about in WiMAX 2. So I am going to talk about here first LTE. So LTE is in WiMAX, if you remember, there is only one frame which is 5 millisecond long. Every frame is 5 millisecond long. Here, and, and the 5 millisecond is too much because if you want to send the data, you have to send a request first. After that, you get a grant. And then one or two frames after that, you get to send it. So that is, you know, 10 to 15, 20 millisecond of round trip just for one frame to get from here to there, right? So these guys fix that problem by making a frame one millisecond long. Okay, we call them subframes. Each subframe has an uplink and a downlink. So if you make a request here in the uplink, the grant may come either in this or the next subframe and then in the next subframe you can send it, right? So the round trip is obviously one fifth, I don't know, a five millisecond, what would have been in five millisecond. However, if you have one millisecond frame, the problem is that the frame header might be too much. Right? So what you do is you don't send the frame header, you send the frame header at the beginning of 10 such frames. Right? So that's why we have a super frame. A super frame is 10 millisecond long. Alright? A super frame is 10 millisecond long and, um, and then it consists of 10 subframes. The super frame header might appear in the first subframe and that's it. I mean and then each of them will have a much shorter overhead and um, so that saves on the overhead but increases the decrease the latency. Yeah. So let's, let's suppose the uh, overhead user I want to send something right but because of the overhead is at the beginning of the super frame. So let's say if I want some uh, what to send what's happening in this subframe too but I have to wait until the I mean you know, super frame anyway no, 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 no. Sub, in, the, in the super frame, you will have things like something which is kind of common among all the subframes, which is, you know, um, your base ID number that we are working on this frequency or, you know, something which are constant parameters, though you don't have to wait for. Once you have joined the network, hold on, once you have joined the network, many of these things you don't need because you already know them. What you are doing here is grant and request and that would be done much faster because you might have some uh, grant from previous time where you can send additional request. Yes, so that is uh, okay. I mean, subframe, okay, is subframe. It is okay, is subframe, right? Yeah, and that is much smaller. Uh, so that, there, there, there is one more thing about feature about that one, and maybe I should, um, uh, maybe it will come in by Max 2 because I didn't put it in this slide. So they also reduced the overhead for normal things. So for example, if you have a voice connection, then you are going to, you don't need to request every time. We will just give it, and they will just give it to you because it is recurrent. It is reoccurring all the, all the time, right? So they reduce that way. But if you have some unforeseen circumstances, then you know you will need to request. All right, so that overhead has gone down. So per frame overhead is gone down for two reasons. 
One is because we have super frame. Another is because for some things we, we just got rid of the overhead. Does that answer your question? The, the whole thing is, uh, this U has a map, right? A map that say that a wish, I mean, a location that the, that um, mobile phone has sent. And basically that is going to be the area of each flat frame. Okay, that I'm not sure. Okay, just a second. Yeah, yeah. So the thing is, it is quite possible that the map could be for all 10 subframes, the map could be in the one frame and plus some additional subframes. So the thing is, it's still, um, you know, how the mapping is done, I haven't got to that level of detail, is that um, some map could be here and some map could be there. And, and uh, the idea is that even if the frame is divided into 10 or 1, you know, that overhead is probably adds up to the same number. Right? Whether you say 10 times, you know, I mean, you know, user 1, this one, user 2, and that one, and then you two is saying 10 subframes or 1 subframe. So the total sub, total overhead has gone down overall, even though it might be divided into 10 pieces. Right? Okay. So that is one, one invention. Second invention is inter-carrier spacing is now like you were talking about last time, why can't we dynamically change it? So they don't dynamically change it, but they have two intercarrier spacing. One for the normal operation, which is 15 kilohertz, and the reason it is 15 kilohertz compared to 10 kilohertz in Bimax is because to allow for a larger variation of the carrier because of the Doppler effect. So you can go faster. So this supports up to 350 kilometers as opposed to Ymax, which was support, which are supporting up to 120 kilometers, so three times more speed it can cover, right? But, and I'm not sure as to why they did this, but for multicast and broadcast, when they are going to do it from multiple cells, they assumed that um, basically, first of all, this will be um, not be running at very high speed, and um, for whatever reason, so they assume that that would be 7.5 kilohertz, and I haven't got, got into detail of that one. So basically, so they have two different carrier spacing. 15 kilohertz is normal, 7.5 kilohertz is for multi-cell, multimedia, broadcast, multicast service. Right? Now because of that, everything else also depends upon what you're using there. So everything is now defined twice including the cyclic prefix you are talking about. Okay, cyclic prefix is different depending upon the carrier spacing. The slot size and so on and so forth, they all numbers change. So now we have two cyclic prefix. Now actually it turns out even for 15 megahertz, we have two cyclic prefix. One is normal, one is extended. Why extended? So if you have, remember, cyclic prefix helps you in, um, cyclic prefix helps you in multipath. Because of multipath, you have reflections and the symbols run into each other. By having a cyclic prefix, the symbols, whatever you lose in the overlap is not lost because they, this is repeated again at the end of the cycle. And so, so they have a, what happened here? It's going backward, okay. So they have a normal cyclic prefix and extended cyclic prefix. Extended cyclic prefix means that they can have only less for the data. And uh, I mean, because the symbols are bigger now, you have symbol and then you have cyclic prefix, right? For, with every symbol. So, so you have only seven symbols, each has 12 carriers, and each symbol is um, 5.2 milli microsecond for the first symbol and 4.7 microsecond for the others. And then extended one has six symbols and each of them is 16.7 microsecond long. This basically allows longer distances, bigger cells, and then for 7.5 kilohertz, they have extended one, and which takes only three symbols, so this is you know twice as big, but it takes 24 subcarriers. Now, it takes 24 subcarriers, but they are only 7.5 kilohertz apart, so when you multiply this, the total width is still the same. The total width is still comes out the same. And, and the symbols are, um, because of this, the symbols are longer, twice as long, because then you have the intercarrier spacing that small. And so that becomes 16 plus 33. All right. So this is a little bit of complication, but, and I, I, I really don't know why 7.5 kilohertz, but at least two things we know. 
<coughs> we know that the cyclic prefix is now they have designed a cyclic prefix which is optimized for the distance. For shorter cells, you use one cyclic prefix. For bigger cells, you use the other cyclic prefix. Right? Second thing we know about this whole overhead thing. So those are two things I wanted to point out. And, and, and then because of this, um, this carrier spacing differences, the symbol sizes are different and so on and so forth. So, th so this complication has come into this. And by the way, everything for every of these slides, I have put the reference here. So please, if you can, get to those and you can get more details there, right? All right, that finishes LTE. And then we are back to talking about the new items, all right? And so the first thing I'm going to talk about is femtocell. Femtocell, the word femto, as you know, is 10 to minus 15. All right? And the normal cell is called macro cell. So macro is not a number. Micro is a number, but macro is not a number. So a normal cell is called macro cell, which covers a few miles, generally has public access, in the sense that it is not inside your home, and it is an open area. Right, but micro cell, which the micro number stands for 10 to the minus 6, the, num the name was just select selected not because of the distance or anything. It just it was smaller than the ma than the macro. All right, so micro cell covers less than a mile wide. It is still public access, but it is generally used in places like malls, hotels, train stations. So these are all public places, and this phone company will go and put its own micro cell in the in the mall for example just to cover inside the building so that's not very different from macro cell in that sense then pe people start talking about pico cell which was um, again smaller than micro cell and 10 to 1 is 12 so for example i went to this um, ymax show and uh, they were selling um, Pico cell. I said, how much would this base station cost? They said, well, they were, didn't have the base station, they had the chip. $750, that is something that I could probably buy and put it in the department. It's not, you know, $750,000 or you know, big thing. So the Pico cells are, again, very low in cost, and but they cover a very small area. So Pico cell is 10 to minus 12. Then comes Femto cell, 10 to minus 15. Now this is for private buildings. So this you can install in your home, all right? And now people are talking about ecto cells, which are 10 to minus 18, which is for a room, and jecto cell, which is for your desk, all right? Although I haven't seen much talk about these, but the names have appeared. Notice that there is no milli cell and there is no nano cell. So in this whole range of 10 to minus 3 is, they missed some numbers, all right? Somehow they jumped straight to minus 6 and didn't have minus 9 and minus 3. But other than that, you know, the numbers have mean nothing. I mean, so it just means femto is, has nothing to do with the size of anything except that this is smaller than pico, and eto is smaller than femto, and jepto is smaller than, yeah, go ahead. So I just wonder if, uh, how can we avoid, or what technique that we use to uh, basically uh, uh, try to, uh, now, if we have a multiple femtocells, right? And then, how can we measure that there is no interference? Yeah, yeah, that's the lecture. So, my, my lecture is coming, continue, just beginning here. So, what is a femtocell is that you get the femtocell from the phone company, and just like you get your DSL modem from the phone company, they send you the femtocell, you know, device, and you put it in your home, and you connect it to your DSL, and it goes by the internet to the phone company. All right, and uh, so this is um, basically it doesn't go wirelessly to the phone company; it goes by wired. What does happen is though you can your cell phone connects wirelessly to this device. So it covers 50 to 100 meter radius, which is a normal home. It is indoor. It is residential, a small home office, Soho and back hall over DSL, that's the key, is that it covers wireless only for the customer, 
but for the carrier it goes through your DSL. And because it has to be installed by the customer, so just like your DSL, you get into the mail, this box full from at and or Verizon or whoever you go with, and then you have to open it up and install it yourself. Similarly, this device will come and install yourself. So, because of that, first thing it has to be easy to install. Because if AT&T has to come or the carrier has to come, they will charge you $200, which is not good for you and not good for them either. So, so this is has to be plug and play, and so they call it self-organizing. And you will hear a lot of these these buzzwords these days. So we hear about self-organizing networks. Alright, so I have a slide on self-organizing networks. S O N. And obviously self-optimizing as well. That means it will di discover what is the right parameter set for it, right? It uses omnidirectional antenna. Now because you're discovering the home, I mean you cannot be pointing it to a particular direction just like you do in the in the macro cell. What you do is you put it on the top of the mountain, but the city is on one side. City is not on both sides of the mountain. So you direct it to the city, right? And here the house is all around this thing. And so this is omnidirectional, no sectorization. It can cover 10 to 50 users, 10 to 40 megabits, and it has to be low cost. We are talking about $200 here. Defined user group. And it is not public in the sense that your neighbor cannot connect to your femto cell. Right? You can connect. So you define, well, I have these three phone numbers. You put that in, and only those three phones connect to it. And, uh, and maybe you won't even define it because the carrier defines it. You know, when you get your cell phone, they, they do some, you know, programming and then your cell phone you're ready to use. Similarly, when they send this to you, it's probably ready to use. You just plug it in and there it goes. Define user group. Continuation of macro network handover of calls. So the key thing is that this is continuation in the sense that if you're talking to somebody on the phone in your car, you come back from your yard, talking on the talking through the tower and then you come inside your home, you're talking through the base station, the handover is done through your femto cell. So it is still is as if you didn't never got disconnected. Regular mobile equipment works in femto cell. So the thing is we don't need any special thing with the with the phone. So you don't need to buy a special phone just to use femto cell. You whatever old phone you have will work with the femto cell. Femto cell has to do all the adjustment. Multiple femto cells should coexist. Now your neighbor could have a femto cell and you could have femto cell and Chacha just asks as to how do we avoid the interference. So it has to do the, something like that, right? And so that is what the self-organizing networks are all about, S-O-N. New applications, HD video streaming and LAN services. Now since you do have this wireless device, you're not just going to use it for phone, it has to do more than the phone, and so it does Wi-Fi. All right, so you get rid of your Wi-Fi device, your Wi-Fi router, instead of your DSL router that you have, you just put this thing, this X as a DSL router, as well as your cell phone device, as well as a Wi-Fi device. And, and nowadays people have uh, these uh, video servers, which you can buy, which do video over Wi-Fi, and uh, over the, for home, in a home distribution, and it will do that as well. And other LAN services, you want to connect your computer, you can connect to it, and uh, you don't have to pay any extra price for that because the data is not going over the internet. If there's internet charge, obviously they will charge you for that, but hopefully you're just starting from one computer to the next computer, and so on and so forth. So this basically, you know, has everything that your router has plus cell phone. Make sense so far? All right. So there are five deployment configurations. The first thing you have to decide is what frequency it uses. And so there are three, three, there are three things that we have to decide. Um, whether it is open or closed, whether it has a frequency that it is using is, is, is dedicated or not, and third thing is the power adjustment. 
All right, based upon those, you get these five configuration. If it is closed group, closed user group, dedicated frequency channel, which means that the carrier somehow gives you a frequency that is yours to have, and uh, fixed power deployment, then that is group one. The second one is closed dedicated channel adaptive power deployment. Adaptive means it adapts to the to whatever the and the spelling of the adapter was wrong in your, so please correct that in your handout. Um, so it changes, closed co-channel deployment, and co-channel means it uses the same frequency as the outside. So if the outside is on 2.43 gigahertz or whatever that is, you know, when you come inside, you are using the same frequency. So there is some interference from the outside to inside. But because the outside cannot get inside, your cell phone probably is not confused. Okay? So co-channel deployment and partial co-channel deployment. So femto RF selected from a set of available channels. So this is like frequency reuse. In frequency reuse, if you remember, we use some frequencies in the center and some frequencies at the edge. Right? Similarly, you could divide your frequencies into some parts which are used inside the femtocells and some outside the femtocells. And then open deployment, which is like a Pico cell. Open deployment is basically it's like a relay. I mean, you know, it's, actually it's not a relay, but it's just a full cell. Okay. Where, uh, this would be more like an MR where user group is not closed. Anybody can just connect to it as long as they have the service with that company and so on and so forth. So those are the five configurations. Now let's see. So closed, dedicated channel, fixed power deployment, RF different from the macro because this is dedicated. 5 dBm power. So this is how much power is suggested now. How much 5 dBm? So 0 dBm is how much? How much is 0 dBm? 1 milliwatt, right. Now please don't forget all this. I will be very unhappy that you took the whole course and you don't know what dBm is now by the end of the course. So 0 dBm is 1 milliwatt. So 10 dBm is how much? How much is 10 dBm? <laughs> if 0 dBm is 1 milliwatt, how much is 10 dBm? No, 10 dBm is exactly 10 dBm, 10 milliwatt, it comes out. The thing is, because the, the, they just cancels out, it's power, you know, we multiply by 10, so it's just, you know, 10 raised to 1. If it was 20 dBm, then it would be 100 milliwatt, right? But 10 is 10 milliwatt. And so 5 is somewhere between 0 and 10 milliwatt power. That is how much power you give up. One channel may be shared by all femto cells. So your, if you are using a dedicated channel, the neighbor may also have a dedicated channel. Dedicated in the sense that actually it is it is dedicated not just to you, but it is not used in the macro cell, right? And um, this one is power just to minimize interference. Adaptive power deployment. In this case, basically, it will measure the interference and reduce the power until you know the it doesn't have. Um, interference or there, or there is some kind of adjustment, you know, between the measure, after measuring the interference. Closed co-channel deployment, same RF as macro, macro attenuated inside the wall. So this is basically we already said all that, some to power adjusted minimize the interference. Then the closed partial co-channel deployment. Okay, so we have said everything. So are these five clear now? Combinations? All right. Now, according to me, there should be eight combinations because there are three variables, but some variables don't qualify, so they just made five out of those eight. All right. Having done that, then first thing they have to do is synchronize. Just like other base stations synchronize, these have to synchronize. So all now they call it home and node B. Remember now, this is not. So we have we have had these words. Node B we already know about, right? Node B was the base tower, BTS in 2G, Node B in 3G, E and B in um, LTE. By the way, um, LTE is now being sold as 3.9G. Okay, 
and the reason it is 3.9 and not 3.5 because 3.5 sounds like not 4G. 3.9 is 4G, all right, when you round it up to one number. And so, basically, it is not 4G, and we will talk about that later on. But that is what, when you get 4G service, you will get is 3.9G. So this is, in 3.9G, we call it E and B. Now, this is, femtocells are designed for all of these Gs. This is not specific to any particular G. And so, this is called home node B, H and B. Home node B. And so, they broadcast preamble at the same time. And the time is aligned to one microsecond. And so, they need to know their clock has to be, if, if one, one cell is going very fast and the others are not going, then they will have problems. So, it is, it is done. Now, the problem is that the GPS can be used, but GPS doesn't work inside the homes. And so, we, they use what we use in our computers, which is NTP, Network Time Protocol. So, your computer clocks are synchronized. And if you have Windows XP, it does it automatically, but some of you can go ahead and check the time thing and you can synchronize it whenever you want. Basically, it has a built-in list of time servers. So, if you click on the clock symbol on your computer, it will open a window and there, you know, if you go to the second frame, it will tell you, you know, internet synchronization and all that. So, that is network time protocol. So, that same thing can be used here. Uh, there is IEEE protocol. So, network time protocol is, is from IEPF, layer 3. And IEEE has a protocol called 1588, which is layer 2. And so, it synchronizes the time to macro cell um, uh, also. Okay, you can do that way too. But basically, I think probably by this network protocol. All right, one thing is solved. Then the question is, what is self-organizing network? All right, self-organizing means self-configuration, self-optimization, and self-healing. Those are the three features of self-organizing. Self-configuring means plug and play. You bring it in, plug it, and it works. Self-optimization, clearly the name indicates, is that then you don't have to worry about, you know, it gets the right parameters set. And self-healing means if something breaks, it fixes itself. All right, and how does it do it? Basically, ba based upon the measurement. So as soon as you install, it measures where it is, what it is, and all that, and it configures itself. And then it keeps measuring all the time. And as the environment changes, it dynamically adjusts its parameter. All right, now this self-organizing network concept is not just related to wireless, it is just networking in general or computing in general, you could say that. So there is a lot of talk about self-organizing networks and this is what we are applying here to our cell phones. So user installable, 70 million EMTS femto cells expected to be sold in year 2012. So this is supposed to be really popular. In fact, I have already called AT&T and asked for one and they didn't give it to me because they are still trialing it in some particular city. If you're in that city, maybe you can get a trial unit, but they are not selling it to other places. And the reason I need it or you need it is because there is no signal inside the home. The phone doesn't ring. And that's kind of very inconvenient when you're living outside. In the city, probably it's not a problem, but you're living a little bit far away from the city, there's no signal. Yeah. Actually, I'm not going to think to mobile hotspot, but there is something which is available to me right now is they call it amplifier or repeater or something which has nothing to do with the phone company. So some other companies sell a amplifier which I can put in my attic and in the attic it gets the signal from the outside and amplifies it and then distributes it to my house. Maybe T-Mobile has that or maybe they have, a, they have the same thing. Maybe they have femtocell. Yeah, so I, I don't know. So, I mean, you have to tell me more about it, but I, I don't know about that. So, um, all right, some to sell. Not physically accessible to the carrier. Now, the problem is that if something goes wrong, the carrier 
cannot just fix it. I mean, you know, they, they have to do it all remote ma management, if at anything. Operator provided femtocell ID is the way it works is that you can sign, you can go to the store and sign in, or you can do it on the web, and you can say, well, I'm Rajan, my cell phone number is so and so, and I need to install a femtocell. Hopefully, it will come from the phone company. If not, I will buy it in some store, bring it here. The website will make a note of it and give me some parameter. Okay, put this number into that, you know. And so that's how it, it will configure itself, okay. Either that or it will go to the web site and find that information. So it will find out the transmission frequencies, transmission power, preamble, which tells it what is ID. This ID cell is the cell ID of this femtocell ID, femtocell area. Some IDs are reserved for femtocells and helps differentiate from the macrocells. When your phone talks, it knows that it is talking to a femtocell. I mean, if it knows about femtocell, because it doesn't have to know about femtocell. It just thinks that it's talking to another tower. It looks, it looks to me that the data people are going from Wi-Fi to Wi-Max. And the telecom people are coming from, you know, macro cells to Yes, the house. actually, so that's exactly that is what is happening is we call it, I mean, actually, there's a name for it, fixed wireless convergence. So everything that, I mean, you know, actually, this is more like a data, mobi data mobile convergence or something like that, is that whatever the data people used to do is the mobile people are doing and whatever mobile people are doing, you know, and data people are going to do. And this is why, I, let me tell you about this course. If you take a wireless course in most universities, they will talk about Wi-Fi. That's it. That's the wireless course. Because they don't talk about the cell phones, the telephone company, that is not wireless stuff. That is taught ta as a part of telecommunication. Right? If there is a telecommunication department. So most places, most books you buy on the on the self, they just talk about Wi-Fi, WiMAX, which are all data technologies, right? They don't talk about 3G. If you buy a book on 3G, that's a different department, different book, different set. Telecommunication is different. However, what we find is that you cannot be doing any business today in wireless without knowing both. And that's why we have difficulty in finding a book for this course. Because I don't want to just teach sensor network or just teach Wi-Fi or just teach you know, 3G. And then, and we get to teach only one course. That's another problem. And I can't teach three wireless courses either. <laughs> so we have to teach all of this in one course, and there is no such book, right? So that's why we are managing it. But the idea is that you need to know all three today, because that is what is happening, is Wi-Fi people have to learn from the cellular companies. Cellular companies have to learn about Wi-Fi, and everything is merging. All right. So you turn on off by consumers. Now, if you are going, going to do a handover, then you have to know where the neighbor is, where the macro cell is, and if the people are going to turn it on and off, then the topology is changing. Right? Previously, the phone company had the tower on the mountain, and they never changed. We know exactly where the tower number two is. Right? 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But now, you know, in the night, somebody may turn it off. And so we have to worry about this dynamic topology stuff. That's all about self-organizing network. Any question about self-organization? Three things. Self-configuration, self-optimization, and self-healing. And you should know the difference between those three, right? Configuration is just initial configuration and, you know, and parameter configuration. Optimization is, you know, better configuration maybe in some sense, right? And healing is repair. Management and configuration, I mean, same thing. Self-configuration, remote configuration by service provider, and the femtocell sensors the channel to detect neighboring cells and may broadcast messages for the neighbors. So it might say, well, here's my cell ID, here's my power, and the neighbor may say, well, here's my cell ID, here's my power, here's my frequency, and so that's how they may adjust the interference. Chaksha, you were asking. May broadcast messages for the neighbors and cognitive radios. So that is another thing. Is cognitive means smart radios, right? So not interfere with primary use of the spectrum. So basically, what happens is this is what we talked about in in the case, in the case of white spaces, where we said, you see, if the television has come on, if the television tower has come on, then you move. That is cognitive radio, right? Cognitive radio realizes that this is not their channel, and um, if somebody else comes on, then they adjust. So there, is, there are several issues in terms of cell design. We talk about some of them, but security is one of the big ones. So, what interface is very easy for CDN and this right? To what? 
Okay, well, I, 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 you know, on the surface it looks okay to me, but I don't know. I mean, I, I have to study more about that and find out whether CDMA or OFDMA, uh, you know, or TDMA has easier time. Yeah, um, it could be. So, network and service availability, denial of service overload. So somebody who can program their cell, so they connect with your with your cell with your base tower. It is rejected. They connect it again. They connect it again. They connect it again. They connect it again, and uh, they could just be keeping your central cell busy with rejecting it. A normal denial of service attack, fraud and service theft. Somebody could you know program and their phones so that they can look like your phone and um, obviously they can do that in the macro cell but um, with femto cell they're probably safer in some sense because I mean macro cells are being watched and uh, if two people come on and I don't know I mean like so this is just because it is there are so many of these and they are in the human's position oh actually there's another thing too it's not your neighbor you could be stealing the services <laughs> you know from the phone company somehow you know so, because this is device you, are, you have in your hand which belongs to the phone company. Some hackers could be playing with that. Right? Privacy and confidentiality. Now we are going over the internet. You see? Previously, we know that the internet is unsafe but the telephone company is safe. You know, the president always makes a phone call, they never send an email. Okay? Because internet is not safe. But um, now, with the phone calls going over the internet, there is security, there is the privacy. IPsec is used between the FAP and the femtocell gateway. So FAP is your femtocell access point, and femto gateway is what is at the phone company, and there is internet in between. So they use I IPsec, which is the secure IP, between these two, so that means there is encryption and um, and authentication and so on and so forth. Okay. Extensible authentication protocol can be used for authentication at the femto gateway. So what is EAP? EAP is another term for the security. Basically what happens is that <coughs> normally we do authentication by asking your password, but there could be many other methods of authentication such as your thumbprint or you know or you know another device um, which you have to carry with you or many other ways of authentication. So what they do is they keep a database, a remote server database where we, we know that this user has to be authenticated this way and we call it um, RADIUS, remote access um, server or something like that. And um, so that can be used. So basically all the, all the authentication database will be here in the core network and whenever whichever house wants to authenticate this gateway will go to the core network and say how do I authenticate this house and then it will using EAP it will authenticate that. Yeah. So what about between the mobile station and the fan? Yeah, yeah. So basically that can be done both ways. See what will happen is most likely even that authentication will go to that server radius server. So the mobile station will give some information to FAP. So this is where EAP fits in. By the way, <coughs> if you, I, I'm not going to go into EAP right now, but EAP is extensible authentication protocol. Is it general enough so that anybody on the way doesn't need to know secure information? So for example, FAP will not know your password, but it can pass that information to the gateway and gateway can say, yeah, this is correct, password is correct. And it will tell FAP that the password is correct, but it still FAP has no idea what password is. So this is, I mean, this is a whole course on networking security. Yeah. So in this case, basically, what what will happen is, first of all, authentication is probably simpler. I mean. Authentication part. See, there are several things we are talking about. Encryption part, they have to select some AES, some number, right? But for authentication, they just take the IEMI or something, some equipment ID number, 
and uh, some other number and then they pass it on and they say ah, this is valid this cell has not been this cell phone has not been stolen and not been reported you know misbehaving fine right so so that database is kept in the central office right all right so that is security part yeah So the question is, what about the quality of service of the internet? Of course, it depends upon that. Your voice is now all white. But having said that, look, 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 look. The cell phone quality is so bad. I mean, would you be rather, I would rather be happy with VoIP than cell phone quality. That's, that's I mean, half of the time I can't even hear what the other guy is saying, and half the time it disconnects, and I mean, you know, it just, I mean, <laughs> half the time it doesn't ring. I mean, I don't know how many half I can add here, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, but his point is, point is, all this priority stuff can work locally, but when it goes to a Cisco router uh, on the way, that Cisco router probably doesn't differentiate between voice packets and data packets. No, no, this is a, this is a share. Okay, well, all right, all right. So maybe that is true too. Okay, the so point is that DSL line belongs to AT and T. <laughs> So, so maybe they will put a router at the other end which understand this voice and data. <laughs> right? Make sense? So the thing is because this is not general internet, it is not going out of the carrier's provider, although it could be different carrier though. It could be that the, eight, the DSL carrier is different than the wireless carrier, but could be same. All right, so much about Samsung. That's done. All I'm going to talk about next is now 4G. So 4G officially is called IMT Advanced, Internet Mobile Tele, inter, not Internet, International Mobile Telephony is IMT, right? And IMT 2000 is 3G. Right? So when they started 3G work, which was early 90s. They said we will have it in year 2000, and so it was named IMT 2000, although it has not come in year 2010, 10 years too late, but that is 3G. So the official name for IMT is 4G. Now, 4G is a very ill defined word in the sense that you can find hundreds of books on 4G which have nothing to do with the 4G. Because up until three years ago, 4G was not officially defined. So anything which was post 3G, beyond 3G, was 4G. All right, and everything that we said in this lecture could be sold as 4G, right? Because it was not defined. But now the strict definition is coming as to what is 4G, and so ITUR has a document 2072 M.2 2072, which says that the 4G technologies have to do this, and there are no 4G technology at this point, by the way. They came up with this document and said, look, you got to give us. Actually, the number keeps changing, so I haven't checked this um, requirement document. I should check. Some places I found 1 gigabit, so I, I would go with 1 gigabit rather than 1.5 just to be safe. Um, and um, at, at some places I found 1.5. 1.5 it still looks too big to me, but anyway. So 1 gigabit peak rate for fixed services using 100 megahertz. 100 megabits peak rate for mobile services running, uh, and, and this is not at 500 kilometers, so hold on. So this is the best rate for mobile services and mobility up to 500 kilometers per hour. So these two are although on the same line, but they're independent requirement. You cannot get 100 megabits at 500 kilometers per hour. Right, at 500 kilometers per hour, probably you get one megabit at two megabit or something like that. But, but the idea is that they have very high requirement none of the technologies today meet that requirement. So it has been put, the bar has been put higher than what exists so that people work. All right. 
additional requirements on latency and handover and wipe efficiency and so on and so forth and the deadline was October 2009. So this thing was done three, four years ago. They said, if you want to call your thing 4G, do this and tell us how you're going to do it by October 2009. All right. So IEEE started a new group called 16M in 2007. And their goal was to get done by 2009, which they did, September 2009. And October, they submitted it on time. The whole working proposal, right? 3G is uh, slightly behind. They started working on something which actually did not, does not meet 4G. So they had just finishing with their 3.9 and they submitted the proposal too on October 2009, even though it is sort of rough, not well done, not worked out, but they call it LTE advanced. So there are two technologies, 16M and LTE advanced. And since both of these are designed by the same guys, the same guys if you want to call it, same people go to both meetings, both of them will be accepted. And both of them will be four Zs. Alright? And both of them are very similar. Alright, I'm going to talk about those. So the requirements are that you should get at least two point two bits per hertz in the cell and um, and the edge you should get this much and the peak you should be able to get 15 bits bit, 15 bits bps per hertz okay so that 15 will translate to that one gigabit you know really the best condition you are just next to the tower not very far with the right power and everything else and you're getting 15 bits but most of the time you will get 2 or you know, 0.6 now these are challenging numbers that's why they put the challenge so these are not the numbers that any of the technologies today meet. All right. And a spectral uplink is lower than the downlink. Why is uplink lower than the downlink? And so what is the difference? What is the problem? Yeah, very low power. And, and then multiple transmissions, right? So that's always the case. So UL is always more difficult. And so with 40 megahertz, these things translate to these numbers. Actually, so I didn't need to put all that. But basically, anyway, so those are the, and then there are some more numbers like that. And then there is another thing which was done in 2003 when um, they started thinking about this thing. And so they said about IMT 2000, future development of IMT 2000. At that time, they didn't have all this thing done, but that is the first thing. 2003, they started thinking about 4G. All right, and um, and then you know so I typically started thinking in 2007, and the deadline was October 2009. They met the deadline, and in fact, it was good because without that deadline, people would not have finished the kind of debate that we have in the standard bodies. You know, we keep debating forever, but because there's a deadline, things moved, moved, moved. Okay, so we're going to talk about 16M. So what does 16M looks like? 16M is an extension of 16E a compatible extension? So if you have a 16E device, one of the requirement is that it should work in 16M. Okay? So that puts some restrictions on how, what they can do, right? But here are some of the things they did. First of all, they have a super frame now, which is 20 millisecond long, which consists of four frames, which are five millisecond long, which consists of eight subframes each, which are five by eight millisecond long. Right? And um, so this reduces the latency. So now if you are a 16M device, you can use, and I will show you ULDL in a minute, you can use, you can get, you can send the request very fast, get the response and send it. If you are a 16E device, you are probably not expecting that fast. You will send and wait for five milliseconds and then, you know, in the next time around, you will send it. So you still behave as if you were in 16E. But 16M devices will work better. And super frames, why? We already talked about that. Super frames means less overhead. Common have overhead goes right here in the first frame. Pre and then six, and the frames are compatible with 16E. 
subframes give you the reduced latency and then groups and persistent allocation for recurring transmission. So now another thing is that they will recognize that you are 16M station and you are not a 16M station. Depending upon you, they will, they will give you the allocation. But if you are 16M station, you could be part of a group where you know, the whole allocation for, you know, is for, for all these stations. Okay. And, um, and similarly for why the recurring, recurring allocation. So basically you get every frame or every subframe or every third frame, you, you get so many bits and so many bytes. So those things you, we tell you once and then we don't have to tell you every time. So we we'll save some talking time. So that is one of the things. So we just kind of borrowed this from where? LTE, right? So this was not known, I mean, this was kind of not common wisdom before LTE, otherwise we would have done it in WiMAX, right? In, in LTE, we realized that we really need to do, you know, two levels of framing, and so here we go for three levels of framing. Second thing, which is not in LTE, but is in 16M, is they call it multi-carrier operation. I find it confusing. I would call it multi-channel operation. But I haven't seen that word, so I just put whatever they put. Multi-carrier was already there, but now we have multi-channel. You could have some frequencies at 2.4 gigahertz, some at 2.3, and you know you could have multiple bands. So they also call it ch channel aggregation. They also call it virtual carrier. Virtual carrier means the real carrier. There are three carriers here, and then each of them is thousands of sub-carriers. But um, so there is one carrier, second carrier, third carrier. So these are total bands, which could be, which may not be contiguous, right? So the idea is that if you really need 100 megahertz, you go to any country. There is no 100 megahertz. If you ask for 100 megahertz, you will get it in pieces here and there, right? So this technology allows you to use those pieces. And the way it works is, now there are two things in this figure. One is downlink and uplink. So you see how cleverly they have divided those frames into downlink and uplink so that a 16M, 16E station thinks that this is all downlink period and then there's uplink period and this is the gap between the uplink and downlink. So it still has a 5 millisecond frame. Here, I mean, this one is for, six, for 16M stations they know DL, UL, DL, UL, DL, UL. It's not next to each other, but there is faster than 5 millisecond. They can, in one 5 millisecond, they can go up and down. All right. So, so if it is a 16E station, it will just use one carrier. If it is a 16M base station, it will use all carriers. If it is a 16M Single carrier mobile station, single carrier, it will just use any one of those three. If it is a multi-carrier mobile station, it will use two or three of these, you know, or four of these, or whatever number of these. Some subset more than one. Multi-carrier. Yeah. So what is the real technique that they use here? Technique? Like, let's see, even we have, because we have three sessions, and then yeah. basically use three or use two or use one. But what is the... Yeah, okay, so there, there, there is one thing, you know, first of all, what if suppose somebody is using two, they will have to probably receive this frequency and then this frequency, so how does the, the design antenna is beyond me, okay? And once the antenna comes in, how do they process the signal, you know, a, a little detail that I don't know, all right? So yes, there is, but right now this is just the outside that I'm telling you for computer, for networking people like us, you know, we just don't know this much and then we move on to the higher layers. But yeah, there is a lot of detail in the physical layer that we need to work out. Cognitive radio yeah, cognitive radio can just figure it out. But the thing is, even the cognitive radio, I mean, um, at some point, so I mean, there is detail as to, you know, how do you combine all these signals and all that. I, you know, Good enough. Anyway, so so few words we need to know. Virtual carrier. When I say virtual carrier, which means multi-carrier, which means you know carrier aggregation. L zone is legacy zone, which is this zone, legacy zone. R M zone for 16 M devices, which is the new devices. And because so what happens is 
zones basically is actually time in the time zone, right? So this time zone um, is for legacy devices. This time zone, and uh, and and then you know there is some time zone which legacy devices do not use, but uh, the new devices can use, right? So that is what that is. And then when they have a deployment. They have to worry about whether it is a brown field or green field deployment. So what is a green field deployment? Green field means totally new. There is no 16E. You go to some new country or new city and you just install 16M and you don't have to worry about 16E. Then you get everybody, you know, high speed and everything else, right? That is called green field. So what is brown field? Brown field is something is already there and you are putting some new equipment. So that is brown field. That is basically an upgrade. Upgrade means there are old people and the new people. All right. And femtocell support is there. Now 16M has officially femtocell support. So it talks about how the self organization works, how the neighbor discovery works, how the interference mitigation works. So all that detail for 16M is in that standard. Yeah. Just a dumb question. Yeah. So can I say that uh, uh, in each country or in each uh, uh, area, they have to pick either LDE or They can't use both. If we use, they use the same frequency. No, they can use both. If and they are going to use both. They are competing. But even though they use the same frequency? <coughs> no, no, no. So they will not be using the same frequency. Basically, frequency is licensed. Frequency is licensed. So, for example, in the United States, when the 700 megahertz license was sold, Verizon and AT&T bought the whole frequency, whole United States. And so now Bimax cannot use it. That frequency. But Verizon can either I mean, deploy the Bimax or LTE. Yeah, obviously we know that they will not deploy Bimax. So I mean, you know, the so thing is, I mean, a carrier could do both, but it would be crazy to do both. <laughs> no, it is past. No, no. The thing is, so for example, in India, for example, they have Bimax all over, right? And, um, and the reason they don't have LTE is because LTE is not here and they want it now. If you want something today, Bimax is there, right? Now when LTE comes, they will have to find a different frequency or different... Um... All right, <clears throat> so that is that. So here is a summary. Now LTE release 8, Bimax 16E, Bimax 16M is known as release 2. By the way, Bimax also follows release numbers now. Now, there is a difference between Bimax and 16. What is the difference between 16 and Bimax? Who does 16 and who does Bimax? IDE is 16. Yeah. Bimax forum does releases. So, Bimax forum takes the 16M standard and whatever they come up with is called Bimax release 2. They have release 1 and release 1.5 also. Although the standard is only 16E, but in release 1.5, they follow 16E and they add some more features. Right? If nothing else, they add more frequencies in 1.5. So now, you know, in one, they might just have 2.3 gigahertz. In 1.5, they might have 2.3 plus 3.4 plus, you know, something else, right? So more countries are covered. So anyway, so this is release 8 of LTE, and this is Biomax release 1 and Biomax release 2. Interface, we you know, is OFDMA, SCFDMA. Um, I should put an FDMA there. And this is OFDMA, OFDMA, both directions. This is FDD, TDD. In release one, they did not cover FDD. Now, even though 16E covers it, but the Biomax forum doesn't. Right? So there is TDD, but in release two, they will cover both. And the reason they have to cover both is because the spectrum is available that way. I mean, if you are going to reuse the old spectrum, it is available as FDD. I already have a license for FDD, so why would I use TDD there, right? So that is going to happen. This was 350 kilometers, this was only 120, now this is 350. Channel bandwidth, you know, all the different numbers, all the way up to 20. Here it could be 20, but I think the release 1 covered only up to 10. Here release 2 will cover up to 40. The data rates, now you just have to see the efficiency. They use, now these are the numbers by the way, for LTE, all these numbers are the numbers that are what we call the nominal sales numbers because um, 4 by 4, the best you can get 4 by 4 is 302 megabits. With 2 by 4, you can get 75, and which is 2 times 20, so it's 40 megahertz. But with, with TDD, 10 megahertz, 3.1, you can get these numbers and so on and so forth. 
spectral efficiency works out somewhere between 0.72 to 2.6 bits per hertz, BPS per hertz, depending upon the MIMOs and other things. Latency here was high, 20 millisecond link latency. The handover latency was 35 to 50 milliseconds. You understand the difference? Link latency is going up and down and down up right, like that, right? That is 20 millisecond. Here it was less than 5 millisecond. Here it is less than 10 millisecond. Handover is less than 30, 50. So what it is is that YMAX R2 is designed to be better than LTE, right? There is one column missing here at the end. What is that column? And LT advanced and that will be better than I <laughs> obviously if it is not better than you guys have not learned the lesson in the sense that these guys who are designing have not learned the lesson right so they will take everything that is in Ymax R2 and then they will design LT advanced yeah before you go to that page, just make sure that uh, Ymax R2 is that when you make another sound the numbers so when you make sound, yeah this would be two times 20 okay. sorry this will be 2 times 20. Obviously, they could not put here 175 and then look like they are smaller, right? I mean, they have to be bigger than 302. <laughs> and they have to fix two, two numbers here. This is 2 times 20 here, this is FDMA. Finally, LTE advanced. LTE advanced is, is not there yet, but it's coming. <clears throat> Actually, it turns out there are many documents that I've listed here which are there, but these are more like requirements than the design itself. <clears throat> so some ideas. So basically, the idea is that it will be designed in release 10. Right now, there is a release 9. Release 10, which will come in 2011 H1. H1 is first half. First half of 2011. So it is about a year away. away. It will use bandwidth aggregation, which is your multi-carrier, multi-channel, whatever you want to call it, operation. It will use clustered SC FDMA. So we had a single carrier FDMA. Now there is a new version of FDMA, which is called clustered FDMA, which I have in the next slide. Then it will use higher order MIMO. So right now we only use 2 by 2 or whatever, 4 by 4. This will go 8 by 8 in the downlink and 4 by 4 in the uplink. Obviously, it, it, it also is coordinated MIMO. So we talked about coordinated MIMO before, but that is not used in LTE. Although I introduced the term, but I found out that that is not used in LTE. That is used in 16N. And so LTE Advanced will use it. Remember coordinated MIMO? Anybody remember coordinated MIMO? Well, we call it cooperative MIMO, yeah, okay, so this here we call it coordinated MIMO, which is the same thing, cooperative MIMO. Anybody remembers cooperative MIMO? Yeah, towers uh, uh, doing coordination. All right, so goals is to meet or exceed IMT advanced requirement, obviously, and the requirements are specified, requirements are advanced, LTE advanced are specified in 3GPP document, by the way, all these documents are public, just like you can go to IETF and download. You can go to 3GPP and download these numbers, 36.913, solution is in 36.914, and this whatever they submitted in September 2009 is in 36.912. All right, last slide is on clustered SCFDMA. So if you remember single carrier FDMA, the way single carrier FDMA worked was that you took your symbols that you want to put in time domain, you took the time domain symbols and then you did the discrete Fourier transform M by M and then you connected all these pins to a IDFT and the rest of them were zero. Because you connected them all together, you got a blob here in the frequency domain which was single frequency that Y. And then on that you put the cyclic prefix and so on, so on. Oh. Now with the clustered, what we have done is they have put a, another box here in between mapping where this pin doesn't just go straight to this pin. This pin could go there, that pin could go here, that pin could go there, and so on and so forth. Depending upon where these pins connect, you may get more than one blob in the frequency domain. If you cover, if you had this M by M here, right, all total by N by N, and you covered it straight forward, then you will get straight OFDMA. You will get total n blobs and they will be all you know separate right here 
depending upon how you map, you can get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, as many blocks as you want. So now, first we said single carrier is better. Right? Now we're saying, no, 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 no. A single carrier is a problem. It does reduce pepper, but there's a problem that if there is a slight interference anywhere in that zone, you are gone. So what do we do? We break that blob. So all these empty spaces are to avoid the interference. Huh? Yeah, so, so basically there is a single carrier and there you have DMA and cluster SCF DMA is in between. <laughs> you see, the technology moves and we come around the same thing, right? So now it enables, up, and now this is only for the uplink by the way, for the downlink it is totally FDMA still. Enables uplink frequency selective scheduling within a component carrier. So you have a carrier, but it is not clean, so you avoid the areas by having multiple sections up. But that will increase the power, right? Yeah, that will increase the pepper, yeah. I mean, you are paying for the pe by, pe by the pepper by having this, yeah. All right, so that brings us to 2010, wireless networking. <laughs> the latest things, the summary is that we talked, I started with HSDPA and HSUPA, which are beyond 3G, they provide higher data rates than 3G. And then LTE came around, which uses OFDM, actually has not come around yet, but has been designed which uses OFDMA in the downlink, but SCFDMA in the uplink. Now you should know what is SCFDMA and what is good about it, right? SCFDMA is DFT pre-coded OFDM and provides 2 dB lower pepper. What is pepper? Next Monday is the exam. What is pepper? Good, you got a good guess there. Peak to average power ratio. Femtocells provides cellular access inside homes and are self-organizing. So the key thing about this femtocell is self-organizing. 16M and LTE advanced are designed for 4G. So those are the 4G technologies. But if you go to Sprint today and you get their wireless uh, Bimax connection, they call it 4G. So they are selling Bimax as 4G. And um, tomorrow, I mean, this one, um, Verizon will sell LTE as 4G, but they are not 4G technically speaking because they do not satisfy the ITU 4G requirement, right? And so 16M and LTE advanced use, both of them use bandwidth aggregation, higher order MIMO and coordinated MIMO and so on so forth. We know what those are right now. Right? Okay. All right. So these are all the pages. Please do read because I, I, I am finding that you guys are not reading and so it just comes in here and goes out there. And uh, hopefully for the exam we'll be ready. Um, there's plenty on the Wikipedia itself. But in addition, I have put um, these references which, I mean, obviously some of these are very, here the thing about the standards, very difficult to read them. So I don't expect you to read them. But if you find a paper like this, Actually, this is not a paper, this might be a presentation even. And then, you know, it's much easier to read, you know, you can just find it and then, you know, read it. And so, that will give you more things. Um, there are some books also. So, let's go to the books. These are three books. And now I have a whole bunch of books on LTE and on, 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 on 3G evolution. I selected these three because as the best. I don't know whether they are in the library. So, and they might be or they may not be because these, I just, I mean, these are not something that we planned in the beginning of the semester, right? These books have, for example, come out just 2010, maybe last month, who knows, you know? And um, so that is that. Um, there are FEMTOCELL standards, which are again available for download from FEMTO forum. So there is something called FEMTO forum. And, um, so there are two things actually, let, let me not confuse you, okay. When something says TR or TS, that is 3GPP document. But there is a FEMTO forum document, which is at the bottom here. Broadband forum. So FEMTO forum has a document called TR069, which they borrowed from FEMTO forum. And they just extended it. 
to include femto cells. So these are all actually three GPP documents on um, on this one. Actually, again, you don't need to read any of these specification because that will be too much. But you need to be just aware of them. Um, similarly, for 16M, all the standards are available online, and I have given you the URLs here and the is, is list of abbreviation. Now. Any question about um, beyond 3G or 4G? Well, there is one thing now you have to do, and let me just say a few things here. First of all, about this course, it's a tough course to teach, and it's a tough course to learn as well. Because, it's, as I said, the reason it is difficult to teach is because most of the material is moving so fast that you cannot go to books, and you cannot go to one book. You need a whole set of books, right? And my goal is that if you go out of this course and you go to somebody and say, I have taken a course in wireless networking, you should have some idea of some of these key things. And then when you need the detail, obviously. So that's why for detail, we gave you the project. So one of each of you is expert in one area where you know more than me on that topic that you worked on, whether it is super grid, temporal cell, LTE, all of these things you also wrote papers on. And hopefully you know better than me on that topic because you have studied a lot more papers and so on and so forth. So we try to make it both ways so that there is something which is really deep and something which is not that deep. Because if we go into deep of everything, then we cannot cover all of this material. All right? And so that is the whole design of this course is to cover the breadth and then depth in one area. And that's how we are able to cover so many topics which are not covered um, in most other courses, in most other places. All right? And um, so it is actually, you know, I mean, for that reason, it is, it is difficult. I mean, it would be easy to follow a book and then, you know, give you the hand, uh, homework right from the book. But here, you know, actually, there's no book and uh, oftentimes there's not enough time to make a homework either because, you know, there's not much mathematics involved. Mostly it is definitions and terms and technologies and so on and so forth. So that is the you know, good and bad about what we have done. Having said that, now you are supposed to evaluate this course between now and the exam day, please. Between now and Monday, go online, evaluate the course. There is one point reserved for that. On Monday, after the exam, I go and see who has filled out. So I don't know what you said. But I do know who, who did not fill out. All right? So if you did not fill out, you will get a zero for that point. Out of five points, we get four. One point for the evaluation. Four are for the rest of the stuff, which is presence and absence that we are talking about, and the class participation, whatever you asked and you know answered my questions. And so I remember who is more active, who is more not active, who is more absent, who is less absent. Based upon that, I will give you four points. And one point is for this class evaluation. So don't forget that. Is that clear? All right. And Monday is the exam. There's no makeup exam. There's no makeup time. The grades will be in. So Monday is the exam. The grades will be in on Thursday. On Wednesday, we will meet at the same time here in the class at 1 p.m. If you have a conflict, let me know. And I will give you a grade right then. And that grade will have every detail of it as to how much you got in this homework and that homework, that homework, and everything else, and how your grade came about, and your final exam paper. If any adjustment has to be made, it has to be made that day. If you don't show up for Wednesday, you are giving up the right to adjustment. Okay? Basically, I cannot fix after that. And so Wednesday, we fix everything. Thursday, we give it, and we fly off. Okay, so that's the schedule. Anybody has a problem with that? Everybody can come on Wednesday at 1 p.m.? Okay? Okay, what are the last two homework you have? Oh, no, the last one I have the list. There is only one homework he has. Oh, so you're saying his homework is missing. The last five people I have in the list in my office, and I will just put that in. 
Yeah. Yeah. And the final exam, as a standard, usual, less of mathematics this time because there is not much mathematics, right? And um, what else? Any other question? It's cumulative. No, it's not cumulative. Okay. I should probably make it cumulative, but that will put too much pressure. And so this is incremental, right where we stopped in exam two, we'll continue from there. However, having said that, remember there's a lot of BIMAX here. Even though we didn't talk about BIMAX, but we talked about LTE. So don't forget some of the terms that we might use in LTE, which came from BIMAX. All right, so don't forget OFDMA, for example. Say, well, this was covered in the last time. I don't know what OFDMA is, you know. Our spectral width, our spectral efficiency, or you know, things like that. Okay, these are things actually we saw, we even talked about today. So I'm not going to ask anything special about um, about the previous exam, but if something overlaps here that you are not supposed to forget. For example, well, how much is 5 dBm? You're not supposed to forget that. <laughs> right? Even though it's not cumulative, but you know, I mean, uh, okay, is, does that answer the question about what we are going to cover? So make sure that you read. If some term comes in, you should know that term, even though it was covered in the previous time. All right. Um, so with that, we are right on time for finishing the class, 4 2 24. Thank you.